Yeah. All right. Um, next week, we'll be here Monday and Tuesday for actual class, and then um, I'll confirm it, but I think Thursday, John Lomax is coming in to talk about um, music, politics, and I'll let you know about that. Um, so um, we have those two, Monday and Tuesday, we have actual classes, and then I'm not sure, like, they actually have an, the university has an exam scheduled for this class, which I guess would be Saturday or month, the following Monday. No, the Monday's closed for Martin Luther King Day. I don't know. Whatever it is, I'll, I'll figure out when the last possible date is, and I'll have you do something at home and turn it in for that, all right? Um, so, the, you know, I, uh, we're, we're talking about the uh, uh, response to the New Deal, and what you see here is, is in, in the first instance, is kind of the emergence, I think, of, of kind of cultural radicalism. But that's not all that's going on. I mean, people like Woody Guthrie embody this era in ways that have lasted probably longer than anybody else. The music of Woody Guthrie. I mean, you know, you have Springsteen still paying homage to that. Uh, in the early 80s, Springsteen read a biography of Woody Guthrie. Um, and uh, I remember seeing him in 1980-81 tour. And he started talking about Woody Guthrie and singing this an acoustic, This Land is Your Land, which was kind of weird, but like even then he was kind of getting it. So this stuff is still there, people like Tom Morello, and, and especially now with the Occupy movement. I mean, I, I, at some point I'm going to do an entire class just on music because it's, it's, you know, going back from Joe Hill on, you can really do a really good, you know, kind of history of America with, with political music. So as Springsteen said, uh, I learned more from a three-minute record than I ever learned in school. And... Um, Nina Simone singing, you know, about Mississippi in f six minutes can tell you something more powerful than, than any professor could in, in an hour-long lecture. So Woody Guthrie is really crucial, but it's not just this cultural movement. There's a political movement as well. Um, there's an organized labor resistance to the Depression and to the New Deal. To keep in mind, and this is really something that's kind of uh, uh, similar with Obama, Roosevelt is attacked and vilified as being you know, a socialist, a communist, a Bolshevik. Some people teased that his name was Franklin D. Rushevelt you know, because he was a Bolshevik, things like that. Roosevelt's approach to the Depression, much like Obama's, was incredibly conservative, inherently conservative. The goal was to preserve capitalism, to do what he could to save capitalism, right? Uh, and so in both cases, you know, Obama did the same thing with the bankers. Roosevelt basically says to the bankers in the industry, fix it. Whatever you need to do, fix it. Well, it doesn't get fixed. And so what he does is incur resistance, much like Obama is today, from the left. Um, Charles Beard, a famous historian, called it thunder on the left. And what you have is this organized resistance, this radical resistance, groups like the communists. Now, the communists were also willing to play ball. The communists would, would form fronts. The communists would participate in elections. Uh, and, and the communists, in fact, you know, kind of surreptitiously told their people to vote for FDR. You don't want a public endorsement from the communists, right? That would be like... Uh, Know, getting a, a public endorsement from uh, Jerry Sandusky, and I'm not being facetious. You don't want to be associated with the communists, right? They're they're considered pretty bad, um, but in fact, uh, um, they do have this political critique. There are others who who are in the mainstream who are actually even more effective. Um, Upton Sinclair, right? You heard that name before? Why? The Jungle. He wrote the Jungle. He was a journalist. Uh, he didn't go away. Uh, he continued to write these incredibly important political uh, novels and books. Uh, in 1927, he wrote one called Oil. Has anybody seen the film uh, There Will Be Blood? Yeah. That's, that's Oil. That's Upton Sinclair's book. It's, it's about... Uh, what's that? It looks a lot better. Yeah. The, the movie is somewhat disjointed. I mean, it's hard to make a movie or something like that. It, it's pretty bleak, but uh, I, I thought it was fairly well done. But uh, Sinclair is, is an incredible journalist. In 1934, he decided to enter politics, and he was going to run for governor of California with a group called EPIC, End Poverty in California. I don't know how that happened. Um, hmm. well, obviously, I did something wrong. Um, um, anyway, uh, uh, Upton Sinclair uh, decided to run for the uh, Democratic nomination for governor of California. With this organization, and Poverty in California, EPIC, uh, his basic plan was that you should take, the state should take all the, the idle farmland and give it over to farmers, to people, and take all the factories and take over that and give it to workers. 
Uh, and then he, he basically uh, uh, said that they would have a, a what he called a production for use system. The farmers given land would, would grow crops on which they'd subsist, subsist. The workers in the factories would produce things, you know, lamps, furniture, things like that, that they would use themselves, right? Um, so this is his program and poverty in California. Epic. Now, I mean, if the state is going to take control of what used to be private assets and then turn them over to the people, what's that sound like? That's nationalization. Now that is socialism. I mean, you know, pretty much, right? This isn't like this is this is a far cry from liberal politics. Roosevelt's a liberal. Remember that. And, 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 and not really a far left liberal. I didn't mention it in cultural politics, but there was also a, a very famous episode, and again, it's turned into a movie. Tim Robbins did it called uh, The Cradle Will Rock. Anybody ever seen that? Uh, a, a very famous composer named Mark Blitzstein got New Deal money, WPA money, to create a, an opera based on the working class. And a lot of people got their starts with WPA. Jackson Pollock got WPA money. Orson Welles got WPA money. Blitzstein wrote this this, this uh, uh, opera, Cradle Will Rock, which is about workers, and it's like, Blinstein pretty much was a commie. If you know, if you're in music, uh, what's the guy's name? Howard Pollock here is working on Blitz, Blitzstein. Pollock's a, a, a brilliant guy. And uh, um, Roosevelt, this is my point about Roosevelt being not much of a liberal. When Roosevelt heard what this movie, what this, I'm sorry, what this play, this opera was about, he withdrew funding and shut it down. And these guys had to walk around Broadway until they found a dark theater where they could go in and they essentially just liberated it and put the show on. So this is the Roosevelt White House. This guy doesn't like dissent. He's no socialist. He's, he's not like that at all. So Upton Sinclair is a Democrat and so is FDR. Upton Sinclair has this program to, to take this idle land, these, these, this fallow land, these idle factories and, and put them to use for people who need it because unemployment is so high, right? at least a third, and who knows, there are no statistics, so who knows really what it is, but it's, it's, it's huge, it's, it's giant unemployment, it's a massive, massive social problem. And so this guy runs for candidate as a Democrat, and he wins the Democratic primary. Now, if you win the Democratic primary, the president from your party, what normally would happen? What would that president in the party apparatus do for their nominee? They would support him. And up in Sinclair's case, uh, so essentially what happens is the Democrats either sit it out or actively help the Republican. Upton Sinclair is defeated in the general election by the Republican for, for governor, but it's a clear signal to FDR that there's dissent within his own ranks, you know, because they consider him to be essentially a tool of Wall Street and the big bankers. Uh, the national, the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, one of the first New Deal programs, um, essentially gave big business the power to do whatever it wanted to fix the depression, and that didn't work too well. John L. Lewis, who by this time is the head of the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, unskilled workers, uh, called the NRA the national runaround. And people said the NRA was a, a bread line for big business. And so um, Lewis was infuriated and said, you know, refused to endorse FDR in 1936. So you have this mass of unskilled workers now who are angry at you as well. Perhaps the best known critic, though, was Huey Long. Um, anybody ever hear, anybody from Louisiana? Huey Long, the kingfish. Uh, what's that? Huey P. Huey P. Long, the kingfish. Uh, one of the more colorful characters. And I think this image of buffoonery, unfortunately, has clouded what is, is a very impressive political resume and, 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 a, and a real commitment to, to populist issues. Uh, Huey Long uh, created a group called Share Our Wealth or Share the Wealth, uh, in which he believed that, much like Upton Sinclair, um, people had a right, like a human right, to jobs and to land. These guys are moving far beyond the liberal consensus, and that's why, you know, when you talk about radicalism or protest, you can't talk about liberalism. They're totally distinct things. People on the far left, if, if you ask them, and I've felt this way myself many times, who the biggest enemy is. They're not going to say the Tea Party. They're going to say the liberals, you know. And, and that's, this is why people like John L. Lewis, Labor, Upton Sinclair, and Huey Long are such a threat to FDR because what they're doing is saying liberalism is inadequate. Liberalism wants to smooth out the rough edges. Liberalism takes place within the context of private enterprise, private market capitalism. Liberalism is not an alternative to private market capitalism. It's a manifestation of it. It's private market capitalism with reform thrown in 
to make the system ameliorative so that the worst excesses don't force people to try to overturn that system. You want to keep it smooth and clean and working. Do you challenge the nature of private ownership? No. Do workers have a right to ownership of the means of production? No. Workers deserve a living wage. People deserve a right to an education and health care. Fundamental things like that occur within the framework of capitalism. They're not an alternative or a challenge to it at all, right? Which is what I guess people don't understand about Obama. Obama's working clearly within the framework of very conservative capitalism. And so was FDR. So people like Long and, and Sinclair and CIO are saying that the government has a responsibility to provide people with things like land and jobs. That's far outside liberal ideology. Liberal ideology doesn't say that. The role of the state in liberal ideology is to create a clear path for commerce. It's commercial liberty, right? In an advanced liberal capitalist state, you have reform so that there are means available for average working class people to do better. Why? Because they become consumers, right? What Sinclair and Long and these other folks, Woody Guthrie and people like that, are suggesting is actually something much different. It's structural. The system is broken. You can't simply tinker with it around the edges. Something bigger than that has to happen. Much like I, I said, the populists were actually a, a challenge uh, to American capitalism. These guys are too, because they're talking about, it's, this isn't just like the state needs to set up a program, a jobs program or something like that. They're saying the state needs to actually seize private assets and turn them over to people in need, all right? I mean, the populists are talking about creating a bank, nationalizing the railroad, yeah. So like some of those European social countries, would they form the left in value? Then, they, you know, like, yeah. France. Oh, yeah, I mean, they have national health care and national education and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of their vision of that so much in the Soviet? Yo, yeah, this isn't a Soviet model. I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, if anything, and, and, and you have to be careful because people, you know, throw their eyes and get upset at you. The U.S. model is far more similar to, to, the, to the fascist model. I mean, America's political economy is a corporatist political economy, the way Roosevelt envisions it, which is essentially what's happening in Italy and Germany. It's not this brutal auto autocratic system, which is why it's not fascist. It doesn't have this authoritarian political system. Under FDR, nobody went to jail because they challenged or questioned him. There were no pogroms. People weren't put on trains because they were part of the wrong ethnic group. Nothing like that occurs with FDR, obviously. I mean, this remains a very free land. You know, for the most part, you know, communists and people like that, but it's really a, a, in that regard, you know, it's a very free society. Politically, though, I mean, the alternative isn't communism. I mean, essentially, in the 30s, that's the way it's posited. Everybody knows capitalism isn't working. You know, I, I, you don't remember, but in, in, the, in the 1990s, that was the end of communism, the death of communism. It's still referred to that way, right? Well, in 1929, 1930, that's kind of what people were saying about capitalism. What I think is what people should be saying about capitalism today. You don't hear that. I mean, what you're seeing today is a crisis in the global system that I think is actually bigger than what we saw in 1989, 1990 with the communists. But the alternative, I mean, basically in the 30s, they want to say, you know, capitalism isn't working. So what are the alternatives? You know, Stalin and Hitler, right? Politically, economically, the American model is far closer to Germany's because they operate within a capitalist political climate. The state gets together with these corporations and they create state policy. They create economic policies. They work together. That's that, that half and half example I gave you with the milk and the cream, right? They're the same thing. They work together. That's how the Audubon gets built. That's how Volkswagen gets started, things like that. When Roosevelt announces the National Recovery Administration, which essentially brings all these corporations to Washington, D.C. and says, you guys create economic policy. You can set codes, create production quotas, set prices, do whatever you want. You know what Herbert Hoover says? Herbert Hoover, his predecessor, conservative Republican Herbert Hoover, you know what he calls FDR? A fascist. Herbert Hoover calls FDR fascism. He said that's American fascism, the NRA. There are all kinds of articles being published at the time comparing Roosevelt and Hitler, basically saying they have a similar view on the world. Now, again, the, they're not taking into account, you know, I mean, Hitler's stated, you know, uh, hatred and, and, and desire to eliminate certain groups. Roosevelt's not like that at all. And the idea that he was, you know, in critics, you know, King Roosevelt and Imperius, that's, that's silly. Right? I mean, you, you remain a very free society. But um, so guys like Sinclair and Long, I mean, they're, they would be social democrats, right? I mean, and that's one of the questions. And, and, you know, in a perfect world, the final exam would simply say, why is there no socialism in America? 
Why is there no radical, you know, history in America comparable to other societies, right? Uh, there was a famous pamphlet in 1919, Werner Sombart, a German sociologist, was called Why Is There No Socialism in America? And the answer was essentially roast beef. <laughs> American workers had access to eat roast beef, so they didn't have any need to be socialist, right? Uh, they lived better. And I mean, Louis Hartz, I've talked about that before, the liberal ideal, uh, was it the liberal, I, liberal tradition in America, basically says the United States doesn't have a history of feudalism. Things as bad as they are came fairly easily because there was land and there was not the same struggle that you had in Europe. So the European left, I mean, in the, in the 30s, what's happening in Europe? Right, you have fascism in Italy and Germany. And in all these other states, you have these massive political contests. There's a real left. There are socialist parties, there are labor parties, there are communists. I mean, Europe is truly in upheaval politically. In the United States, what do you have? You have liberals and conservatives, all operating within a very narrow and same framework. And when we get to the 60s, that's going to be a major theme. I mean. Uh, uh, um, uh, La Raza Unida of Colorado uh, had a, I don't know, it was a cartoon or whatever, and it said basically, uh, uh, in the American political system, Democrats and Republicans are, are two pigs who are feeding out of the same corporate trough. And that's a, a, you know, a more colorful way of saying you have a very small political system in the U.S. And so somebody like Long or Sinclair, who in Europe would simply be considered soft social Democrats at, at worst, you know, they wouldn't raise any eyebrows, and people might actually even like roll their eyes, saying, oh, you guys aren't going far enough. In the United States, these guys are really threatening the state. They're challenging the nature of the state, all right? Um, let's see if this plays. Long believed a speaker needed to entertain to be effective. All of his speeches were marked with humor, colorful language, and a forceful delivery. Long would occasionally hold press conferences in his pajamas. He never wrote speeches ahead of time, believing that notes made his delivery stale. He could tailor his speeches to any audience, having an almost intuitive understanding of appropriate language. In an instant, Long could switch from crude barnyard talk to religious homily. Journalists loved to quote him, and radio stations would compete to over airtime. His message was simple America must redistribute as well. To promote this idea, Long started a grassroots campaign. This effort was not to be taken lightly. By 1935, over 7 million people had signed up, and nearly 20,000 new members were joining daily. Just before the end of the fall session of Congress, Long spoke to a group of staff members on Capitol Hill. According to the tables which we have assembled, it is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America, and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many of you ever went to the barbecue? And would let one man take off the table what they intended for nine tenths of the people to eat. The only way you'll ever be able to feed the mouths of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he got open. <laughs>
going to destroy the Gulf Refining Company. We're not going to destroy the Standard Oil Company. But we're going to say that the limit of any one man's stock ownership in the Standard Oil Company is from three to five million dollars to that individual, and that the balance of the people of America own the balance of what the Standard Oil Company is doing. All right. Then, we start from the bottom that the 25 or more million American families shall have a homestead, a home, and the comforts of a home, including an automobile and a radio, the things it takes in that house to live on. We say to America, 125 million, none shall be too deep, none shall be too poor, none shall work too much, none shall be idle. No luxurious mansions empty. None walking the streets. None in poverty. None in factory. None in walk. But in the land blessed by the smile of the Creator, with everything to be consumed, to be eaten, to be worn, and America will become a land, sharing the fruits of the land, not for the favored few. Not to satisfy greed, but that all may live in the land in which the Lord has provided an abundance sufficient for the luxury and convenience of the people in justice. I think. Long recognized that his plan had faults and told that confiscating funds from American millionaires would provide less than one dollar and fifty cents for each poor family. Long replied, Well, when they figure that out. I'll have something new for them. <laughs> Besides, he continued, there are 20 million votes in that. Now, you can imagine, you know, Land, uh, uh, Long is talking about redistribution, redistributing wealth, which in American politics, you just, you know, you just don't go there. So this is, con this is, this is really, you know, out there. This is truly a radical alternative. Um, in addition to uh, uh, the share our wealth, uh, Huey Long, uh, and this doesn't happen very often, actually wrote his own theme song for his campaign. Uh, he and the uh, band leader at LSU got together and they wrote a theme song, Every Man a King, which they played a snippet of. But, you know, so this first scene. <laughs> Like Miss Louisiana or something like that, who I suspect Huey tried to get to know better. He uh, had quite a reputation. Uh, uh, I think uh, several jealous husbands uh, took shots at him throughout his life. Uh, but that's a great song, isn't it? Uh, if there's something belonging to others, there's enough for all people to share. I mean, in American politics, that's that's really radical. It, it may not seem like it, but in American politics, that's as far out as you can get. And this guy is mainstream. He's a senator. You know, he has millions and millions of followers, and he's thinking of running for president. He was assassinated in 1935, which took away Roosevelt's main challenge. Um, Huey Long's kind of a larger-than-life figure, and, and uh, Randy Newman has uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, done a lot of stuff on him. Randy Newman's actually covered every man that can. You know Randy Newman is, right? 
and your generation is the guy who does all the Disney songs, right? Disney. Uh, what's that? Yeah, Cars and Toy Story and all that kind of stuff. That's Randy Newman. But before that, and he still does actually. He's an incredible political satirist. He's done some of the most amazing political satire. Um, he has an album called Rednecks. Check it out. Um, but he also wrote a song about Huey Long, which um, is kind of fun. Now, people like Sinclair and, and, and Huey Long, John Lewis, and others um, obviously don't create this alternative. I mean, in retrospect, when you think about what they're saying, it, it may not seem all that crazy or radical, but at the time, and even now, I mean, in American context, I don't want to, it's not a, a temporal thing, it's more of a contextual thing. In the United States, what they were talking about was, was really oh, far over the edge, you know, kind of the seizing assets and things like that. What it did, though, and, and I would argue that, that if you want to make the case that these radical movements ever have an impact, this is how they do it. What it does is it shifts the political system, in this case, to the left. I mean, you can make the argument about the populace, right? The populace were crushed, but you know, the stuff that the populace talked about, like women's votes, public education, things like that, certain regulations, actually come into play later, to some degree, because the populace raises to and shift things to the left. And, and that's what I think these guys do the communists and all these other groups, Roosevelt listens to him because essentially these are the people who put him into office in 1932, and he didn't really do a whole lot for him. I mean, as far as they were concerned, he, he talked the talk, but he didn't walk the walk. And so by 1935, you have this real sense of alarm among Roosevelt's people that the folks who put him in office in 32 are going to desert him, much as the, the White House today knows that those kids who walked in 2008 aren't going to do it the next time he runs, which is why he's running this Wall Street campaign, and he's just going to blow everybody out of the water in terms of money spent, right? And Roosevelt kind of gets this in. But Roosevelt, unlike Obama, actually says, okay, I better listen to these people. So uh, as a consequence of this kind of pressure, you get things like Social Security, which actually was a response to a, There was a doctor in California, Francis Townsend, who had started these pension clubs for, you know, when you're old, you, need, you, know, you want to retire. So Roosevelt creates Social Security as a way to kind of appease senior citizens and as a way to steal and co-opt. The left gets co-opted. That's kind of the point I'm making. There's this idea of pushing the spectrum left. You can also co-opt their ideas. 
which is what a lot of people are trying to do to Occupy movement today. And that's a huge fight within the Occupy movement over, you know, that's why they're very leery of letting anybody else in because they don't want some other group like Move On or the Democrats or whoever to take over. Um, so Roosevelt does that. He, he takes these pension clubs ideas and he creates Social Security. The kind of stuff that Sinclair and Huey Long were talking about, essentially a public component. Now, Roosevelt's not going to go that far. He's not going to take over land. But what he will do is create a, a public jobs program, which is why you get the, the Works Project, the WPA, Works Project Administration. The government creates work. It, it allocates billions of dollars, the biggest allocation for public funding at the time. And it, it creates jobs. It's, it's based on, uh, uh, and Roosevelt wasn't a Keynesian, but it's kind of based on Keynesian ideas. In the United States, Keynesianism is radical, which is ironic because if you know who you know you know what Keynesianism is, you, you hear this a lot. It's it, John Maynard Keynes was a British economist, an aristocrat actually, and that's why it's ironic. It's been associated with this radicalism, and today Keynes is like a dirty word, right? I mean, it's almost like uh, uh, you know you have Ayn Rand and Keynes, you know, going at it, which uh, I think really is demeaning to to Keynes. Um, Keynes isn't a radical. I mean, if you're a Marxist or a, or a socialist, you're not a Keynesian. Keynes, however, and, and he was a, a, he's the guy who more or less, uh, he was the, led the British delegation after World War I to create the post-war settlement. And he was livid at the, at the huge penalties given to Germany. He very accurately predicted that that would be a disaster. Anyway, Keynes' basic economics, does anybody in here study economics and big know anything? What do you know about Keynes? Well, he was just more government spending than he works uh, the bottom line. I mean, Kane, you know, like in the 80s, Reagan had something called uh, trickle-down economics or supply-side economics. It's the, opposite. it's the opposite of that. Supply-side means you deal with the supply. You give benefits to the people who supply goods, the producers, right? And then you take care of them and, and, and the, the benefits will trickle down. Keynes was actually the opposite. He never called it this, but you could have called it demand-side economics. In Keynes' version of economics, what was the most important element? This was more essential for economic health than anything else. Well, but how? Taxes. Employment. Jobs. Jobs were more important. It was kind of a demand side thing. Keynes understood that people had to buy things and, you know, in a very simple way, shredding aside all economic theory and everything else, whatever they teach you in econ or the business school. You can judge an economy fairly easily. You know? Simple question. Do people have enough money to buy the stuff they need? Do people have enough money to buy the stuff they need? Keynes understood that. So the goal of the state, in Keynes's mind, was to provide workers to provide employment. Now, sometimes you did this with government intervention in the economy, government spending, government deficit spending. Debts weren't necessarily a bad thing. I think it's ironic that, you know, we just went through this, this orgy of spending with wars and tax cuts where you run up all these because it's trillions, got trillions of dollars in debt. And all of a sudden Obama comes in and gets, and, and uh, you know, he hasn't done a good job of acquitting himself, but he gets blamed for it, right? And now all of a sudden we're all deficit hawks, you know? This isn't like I owe money to a bank. American debts are owed to you. Owe it to yourself. It's you know, you just give yourself a break. You don't have to pay it this week. You know. Yeah. He was for running up the deficit during recessions. Keynes. Right? Yeah. So like he had no problem with that. Increases as the as the economy. I mean, basically, you have to fill that, right? Um, uh, um, what it was? A, what do we call it? A liquidity trap when you didn't have enough liquid assets, right? So in the, in, in the absence of private industry, spending that money, creating jobs, getting economic kind of money in circulation, Keynes said that the state should do it. Now, Roosevelt's not a Keynesian, right? But in 1935, kind of in response to what people like Sinclair and Long are saying, he creates the Works Project Administration. And before that, they had the PWA and some other government programs. What the Civilian Conservation Corps, what the government does is essentially create jobs. How does it do this through public works? It's going to build highways. It's going to build airports. It's going to build post offices, schools. There's a great uh, video. Uh, normally I'd show it, but it's fairly long, and I'll put it up there so you can see. Um, of uh, uh, um, in New York, it built a swimming pool, and it was an African American neighborhood. Built a swimming pool that had a nurses station in it and a and a daycare center and things like that. So the state takes an active role in creating jobs and creating. Um, uh, 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 economic activity by building public works, like I said, post offices, community airports, schools, health centers, roads, highways, stuff like that. All right, this is a massive subsidization of employment. 
and Keynes thought employment was more important than else. I mean, the, the general theories. What is it? The general theory of something interest in employment, right? Um, and it actually works. I mean, you start to see an improvement in the economy, 1935, 1936, into 1937. So what FDR does is co-opt the left. He takes these ideas. Uh, he's not going to give land to, or factories to people, which is what Sinclair and Long are talking about. Roosevelt will, will rhetorically talk about the malefactors of wealth, but he ain't going to stand up to like Huey Long did and say, 4% of the people own 85% of the wealth, right? You could take that speech and transport it into 2011, and, and you wouldn't know. I mean, if I played the audio of that speech or gave you a transcript of it, you could easily say, somebody at Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street yesterday said that, right? So, so Roosevelt's nowhere in that ballpark, but he has to respond. So what he does is call out the level of programs like the WPA, he gives labor the right to organize, and we'll talk about that in a moment with the National Labor Relations Act, uh, 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 the, the, uh, or the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act gives workers the right to organize, to bargain collectively. So Roosevelt does listen to the left, and he responds to them, and essentially co-ops them. What this does, it does two things. It gives him, um, it gives him a, a, a credibility politically, and he easily wins re-election in 1936 with uh, uh, substantial left-wing support, um, and it also helps the economy start to improve, yeah. So the form of failing in the 30s that you're trying to get in America to co-op the anarchism of the American economy? Well, no, I mean, but it, there are people for so many reasons. Um, this isn't a leftist country. It's never been amenable. Uh, I, I mean, if there were ever an era in which Americans were more amenable to the left, it was probably the 30s. I mean, the Communist Party had a million members, right? Population, I mean, Huey Long, share our wealth, had seven million. Upton Sinclair's pension, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, Francis Townsend's pension clubs had many million, four or five million. Epic, I mean, Upton Sinclair got nearly a million votes. So the Communists having a million members, while it's impressive in the, in the context of what the Communists usually do, they're still the Communists, right? They're still a fairly minor splinter group of people who are considered, you know, kind of nuts, right? Um, so, I mean, the U.S. just isn't a left. It's not. It's never been. I, don't, I can't say it never will be, but it, it's hard to imagine it would be. So, I mean, the failures of the left essentially are just, they're, they're, they're a given, right? You're, you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're playing poker with all your cards showing, and the other guy gets to keep drawing until he beats you, essentially. Uh, so that's the biggest problem. I mean, you're, you're not living in a climate, in a political economy that's conducive to anything like that. Um, what they're what they're what they're seeking, which by most socialist standards is pretty tame. Like I said, in, in the European context, people like Long or Sinclair would be soft social democrats. Within the American context, is is incredibly radical. I mean, remember what happens after I've used this example many times because I think it's so illustrative. Uh, what happens after the Civil War with the the Freedmen's Bureau? Right. I mean, how many? Like I said, three point five million slaves are free, right, after the Civil War. How many get land? 30,000, 40,000. Freedmen's Bureau lasts less than two years. The idea of taking land, of redistributing private assets, is so radical in the United States. You don't do that. Look at how many interventions the U.S. Well, the, U the U.S. interventions in the 50s and 60s, Iran, Guatemala, Chile, Cuba, places like that, what were those states doing that pissed off the U.S. so much? Killing their people? I mean, if that were the case, the U.S. would have overthrown every right-wing government which was allied to. Why was the U.S. so upset at those states? They were nationalizing basic industries and, 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 and redistributing assets, all right? So, uh, I, I mean, I can't stress enough. I mean, people like Long and Sinclair are really, really radical. Why did they fail? In part, I, the, the major reason is it's not very satisfying. Huh? They got shocked? Yeah. Who shocked? Oh, Huey Long, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, Huey Long got shot, yeah. But I mean, was he going to defeat FDR for the nomination? No, nah, no way, right? Would he have monkey-wrenched things enough? And I don't like playing what-ifs anyway. I don't think they're terribly useful. Um, the, the, the point is, what they were seeking was so far out of the mainstream. And it was only, I mean, desperate times, you, know, you know, desperate times bring desperate men out, right? I mean, why do you think 90, I mean, look at how popular Occupy Wall Street is now. I mean, you know, when that began, even somebody like me who, you know, you know, weeps at the international, right? 
thought, this is going to last two weeks tops. What a bunch of nuts. What a bunch of silly kids, you know. And it's still going. Why? Because things have gotten so bad that, that even the New York Times, and if the New York Times says it, it's got to be true, right? Uh, but, I mean, you can't ignore that anymore. And that's what's happening in the 30s. The situation's so desperate. I mean, think of this. And, and, and think it through. Which is, I don't mean this in any kind of offensive or insulting way. Things were so bad in America. And this isn't an indictment of the person. Things are so bad in America that an African-American named Barack Hussein Obama was elected president, right? Under normal circumstances, that would not have happened. This is essentially a racist state. The situation became so bad that Americans were willing to say, we'll, we'll give them a shot, right? Now, the fact of the matter is that a, a, a great amount of the venom directed at him has nothing to do with his politics or Obama or anything. It's because he's black, right? But, but the fact is that, that Americans were so desperate. And I don't mean this as a, to me, his guys are brilliant. I think he's a terrible politician. I think he's a brilliant guy. I don't think he's a good president, but he's a brilliant guy. Um, but in fact, you know, uh, uh, when situations are dire, people are willing to try things. And Obama gave them this sense of hope. And the rhetoric was beautiful and stirring. You know, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. You know, I sent him money at the end of the campaign. I, I just thought it was so important, you know. And I still think it is. But, but uh, um, um, you know, we tend to kind of create in people what, what we want them to be. And so uh, uh, when situations are desperate, and they were in the 1930s, people are willing to listen to, to folks like uh, uh, Huey Long or, or Upton Sinclair, right? And that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, but they were still pretty far out there. And yeah, I mean, co-optation has a huge part of it as well. There's, there's a huge role in that. I mean, once Roosevelt announces Social Security, the Wagner Act, PWA, WPA, Civilian Conservation Corps, things like that, the left doesn't have as much to bitch about. And, you know, once you quit bitching, you've kind of lost your political base, right? And so you need to get these people fired up. So what do you do? You take credit, you join alliances, you tell people to vote for FDR in 36, you brag about what you did and all that kind of stuff, but you don't build a movement that way. And that's another reason I call it radical. My first one, when I listed this class, which actually was a spur of the moment thing, it's like radical movements in U.S. history, and then the next day I went and I changed it. Because, and I know people like Scott would definitely disagree with me, I don't think there are radical movements in U.S. history. There are temporary things like civil rights was very effective. I would argue the most effective, actually. Um, but it's 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 temporal. You know, the modern civil rights movement begins after World War II. By the late 60s, the the backlash against it from whites, liberal and southern, is is intense, right? So uh, uh, yeah, co-optation has a huge part to play in it. But I mean, there's just these, and if anything, you know, to come out of this, and it's terribly depressing in a lot of ways, and which is why. You know, I'm kind of a, a Debbie Downer, because people on the left want romantic histories. The people struggled and the people won. Like, Howard Zinn, how many of you read People's History of the United States? You know, I, I knew Howard. He was a wonderful, beautiful man. He wrote elegantly. Um, but Howard's work was, I think, really over-romantic. Every time two workers got together and bitched about the boss, there was class struggle going on. <laughs> Every time five people signed a petition, there was class consciousness. I, I wish that were so, but, but describing it that way doesn't make it so, right? Uh, I do have a fairly discouraging view. I don't think there are radical movements in U.S. history. There are times when people come together and they can do beautiful things, and I think the civil rights era, uh, people like King, who's just a, a, an amazing icon, I think he's one of the most important men in history, not just U.S. history, in, in global history, but it was limited. Yeah. How are you defining movement? Movement? How are you defining movement? How would I define movement? I think it's a, it's a sustained effort over time, which incorporates a group, a larger group that, that in fact, maybe a disparate group, takes a lot of folks into, into, into it and um, has kind of a, 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 a structural impact where it actually changes the nature of society. I mean, I think civil rights fits that. No, civil rights does. I think it does, but it's also temporal. And there's a backlash. I mean, yeah, but, I mean, all right, I, I'm not an idiot, you know, well, hey. Talk to some of my colleagues on Randall Couture, they would differ, but uh, um, only an idiot would say that, you know, the situation in America for blacks in, 19, in 2011 is the same as it was in 1960, or it's no different. That's insane. That's stupid. It's, it's millennially better, right? At the same time, what people assume, what liberals and African Americans and others assume would take place after 19, in 1968, the future they envisioned hasn't come true. It hasn't. And that's the point. I mean, you know, there is a movement, and, it, and, it, and I think it meets those criteria. It's incredibly successful. 
but then it gets stopped. So is it, is it sort of that it like got stuck with the moral issue and dealt with that and never dealt with the class issue? Well, and, and in fact, I think, I think that's one of the issues that, that like things like civil rights, we tend to turn into moral, epic moral struggles, and, and there obviously is. But at the time, that's, that's not why civil rights happened in the U.S. It wasn't because a bunch of white people said, oh my God, we've been racist for so long, we, we're ashamed of ourselves. I mean, the abolitionists didn't feel that. That's not why civil rights takes place. There's a lot of reasons for it, and a lot of them are structural. As soon as, you know, say basically, as soon as the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, I'm giving away next week's thunder, as soon as those things gets passed, white America can sit on its hands. They're very proud of themselves. Look what we did. It's very we paternal. Elected yeah, we elected Obama. That's what we did, right? We're, we're good. We elected, we gave him a chance, he blew it, right? What, what did the onion say? Black man gets worst job in America, right, when he was elected, right? No, exactly. We let you vote, you know, and it's this very paternalistic, we let you vote, we gave you the vote, we gave you the right to sit on the bus. Now, if you screw it up, that's your problem, it has nothing to do with us, you know. And, and so, but I mean, that's, I, I don't think in general there are movements. I don't, I mean, you'd be hard pressed from the 1970s on to talk about, you know, civil rights movement in America, it's not really there. I mean, gay rights, I think, I think that the gay movement, I would consider that a movement in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the gay movement, if anything, is going to, to, to disintegrate simply by success. It, it is, I think, the, the arguably the most successful short, in, in a short span of time, movement in American history. I mean, think about that. You know, the, 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 the modern gay movement begins in the late 60s Stonewall. and Stonewall, and less than 50 years later, there's a real integration into American life, economically, politically, culturally. I mean, clearly not, you know, we don't have a gay president, right? Right, but no, right, no, I'm agree. But I mean, comparatively, look how long it takes blacks or women to get to a comparative point, literally centuries. I mean, what, what gays are able to do in, in decades, it takes these other groups centuries to get to. So that's a movement, you know, but, but by and large, and the other part is too, is I, I'm kind of taking this kind of modern, moder, uh, uh, kind of typical Marxist view, movement should be class-based. I think a movement to be successful has to take into as many account, incorporate as much as it can, and that generally would be a class-based movement, you know? And so that's why I would argue that. I mean, at the end of the day, most societies, every industrial society that I can think of has a labor party or a socialist party. The U.S. doesn't. And I don't know of any other state, a contemporary state, similar state that, do, that, that, that doesn't. Canada, Australia, Japan, all of them have these kinds of political groups. The U.S. doesn't. Right. What? <laughs> Japan has a, a, a left party, socialist party, yeah. um, labor parties, things like that. I mean, the U.S. I mean, and they're they're legitimate. They're within. I mean, the U.S. has them, but they're they're laughable. You know, Eugene Debs and Norman Thomas got those, but realistically, you know, I couldn't tell you who the socialist candidate was. I there's no you know, communist party. It was a joke, right? So that's why you know it's it's kind of discouraging. But there are radical moments, not so many radical movements. Um, civil rights, yeah, I think that, that, that's legitimate, absolutely. I think it also embodies some sense of success. So, so um, and, and what you have then in the 30s, I think, was probably, in many ways, the most sustained and serious, and I gotta be careful here because I don't wanna disown what happens like in the, in the late 19th century with those labor struggles and the mining wars. You know, I mean, those, those guys in West Virginia, those are tough sons of bitches, those miners. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing at what they do. Right, uh, but at the same time, mining conditions in West Virginia today really haven't changed a whole lot. What you have in the 30s is almost the mainstreaming, and I don't like to use that word, but, but kind of like that of the left. Woody Guthrie's a rock star. Will Rogers was a comedian. He was much like Colbert or, or somebody like that. He was the most famous, you know, uh, Broadway plays. Like I said, Clifford or that's uh, Upton Sinclair. Pull it, I, he won, I know he won, didn't he win a Nobel? I think I think he won a Nobel Prize for Literature, right? I mean, that, was, that wasn't out there like it would be later or since. I can't think of a time when you could be a communist. The communists marched, they had parades, right? I mean, they're not gonna do that today, right? Um, the Scottsboro Boys' defense was run by the communists. African Americans openly embraced communists. I mean, can you think of another time in history when any group would openly embrace communists? They run away from it. In fact, after World War II, African Americans are so afraid of communism that they essentially disown some of their most important people, like Paul Robeson and Du Bois, right? Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, they kick him out. 
because he's a communist, right? In the 30s, that wasn't the case. Eleanor Roosevelt had tea with communists, right? Eleanor probably was, yeah. It's hard to tell, but I suspect, you know. No, I, th I think she was, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, she spoke about family planning at the White House, you know. First ladies talking about birth control. That was considered way out. I mean, you think, you think any of the first ladies since then would do that? Maybe Betty Ford, you know. I mean, you know Hillary wasn't gonna. You know Laura Bush wasn't, although she might have been more likely than Hillary, but, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, no, Eleanor was. And that's the point. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, could have this open public role. I mean, she went to West Virginia. She went in a coal mine in West Virginia. She went down there to, 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 to see what the miners' lives were like. Can you imagine, you know, anybody doing that? They're so concerned about image and everything. So there's a legitimate left in the 30s. There's a legitimate protest movement. Even then, you know, what Roosevelt does, even this co-optation with things like the Wagner Act and so forth, leaves, leaves a lot of situations unchanged. And what it, what it takes at that point, in a lot of cases, is the sustained efforts of the people. The, the best example, I think, is the Wagner Act, and I don't want to go into it too much, because I, I have this stuff up here you can look at. Um, the Wagner Act is supposed to give workers the right to organize a collective, organize and collectively bargain. So according to the Wagner Act, if you want to form a union, prior to the Wagner Act, if you want to form a union, who would run the vote? You're the workers, I'm the boss. I own the place. I would. You'd say, I want to form a union. I'd come in. I'd say, okay, who wants to join the union? And you'd all raise your hands. How many of you are going to raise your hands if the boss is saying, who wants to join the union? Right? Because I fire you all immediately. Da, da, da. There's grievances. Who, if you have a grievance, who do you go to with the grievance? I'm sexually harassing you, or I'm, I'm not giving you overtime pay, or actually there were no sexual harassment laws. I'm not giving you overtime pay. Or uh, I fired you because you missed a day because you were sick. Or uh, I shorted your paycheck, you know, blah, 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 whatever. You have a grievance. Who do you go to with that grievance? You go to me. Or you get a lawyer. Can you afford a lawyer? All right, so you go to me. So what the Wagner Act does is it creates the, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, to conduct relations and to uh, uh, hear grievances, right? Even then, what does business do? What do industries do? They just ignore it. They just pretend it doesn't exist. And so this is happening in the auto industry. And so workers at Ford finally, in 1936, just decide to take the law, so to speak, into their own hands, and they have a sit-down strike. They just refuse to leave work one day. And this goes on and on and on. The governor of, of Michigan refuses to send the militia out, which is unusual. Um, there's also a major role, and, and watch this video with babies and banners. It's really wonderful. It's actually about the women who were involved in the Flint strike, the Women's Emergency Brigade, and it's, it's, really, it's really powerful. Uh, the wives and mothers of the strikers had a huge role to play because when the National Guard came out, the women locked arms and basically said, you're going through us. And so it didn't turn, you know, the, the, it didn't turn violent. Franklin Roosevelt didn't support the Flint strikers. Go to the end here and you can go to the bottom here and you can, uh, you can actually watch it right there. And I would, it's, it's wonderful, it's only 45 minutes. And there's some transcripts there of people who were actually uh, uh, um, active in the, uh, the Flint strike. And there's a whole, I mean, this, is, this is a really neat website. Um, anyway, um, it's only that sustained sit-down effort that gets the Wagner Act accepted in certain industries. This is when, and this is huge, this is really important, uh, kind of a, as a mainstream radical statement. It's because of Flint and similar strikes like Flint. There was one in Ohio near where I grew up in the Youngstown area. Um, through this, unskilled industrial workers became organized. This is really the genesis. This is what they were talking about in 1877 during the Great Strike, right? That was what it was about, right? Railroad workers and steel workers, miners, unskilled workers, right? Now, we're, we're over 50, almost 60 years later. Flint takes place in, in, in 36 and 37, right? You still don't have that. It's the sit-down strike at Flint, and finally the recognition that you need to end these labor wars that, that gets recognition. But what Flint does is that it enables people in the, in the auto industry, miners, uh, um, uh, you know, oil workers, things like that. There aren't that many at the time. Groups like that, steel workers, finally legitimately get recognized as unions. This is how the CIO becomes powerful, the Congress of Industrial. That I is important to see of the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The American Federation of Labor remained, even to that point, mostly an organization of skilled workers, right? 
it didn't want those industrial workers there, right? I mean, for lots of reasons, including ethnicity. They tended to be European. They didn't speak the same language. They were the great unwashed. They spoke funny, that kind of thing. They were the kind of people who would have been in Lawrence, right? And make sure you read that book because I will, you know, I will have you um, answer to it. I had hoped that we could talk at length about it, but I don't want to take away from this other stuff. So um, Flint ushers in this new era. And again, this is co-optation, right? I mean, think about it in terms of the state. In the long term, what works better? Do you want to continue to repress these people and have labor wars and sit-down strikes? Or is it better to say, yeah, it's okay to have a union and we're going to give you a living wage? And there's social harmony there. They come to work, you know, and if, if you give them a higher wage, what do you do as a businessman? What do, if I'm Ford and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a pay raise, what am I going to do then? I'm going to just raise prices on my cars, right? And, I mean, as Henry Ford understood, you guys can buy the cars you make, right? So, uh, uh, um, and again, it's, it's a bit of a co-optation strategy, but it's also this recognition. See, good capitalists, you know, smart capitalists, Will, will alter and adjust their system and, and realize that, that it's easier to create consumers than it is to simply crush people all the time. And in the 30s, you know, that was, I, I, you know, Herbert Hoover, the problem with capitalism is capitalists, they're too damn greedy. And Roosevelt understood that as well. But these guys aren't radicals by any means. The radical alternative, and people like Huey Long and Adam Sinclair, is co-opted, defeated. Uh, uh, and, and so what you get out of it are things like these, the, the, the success of the Flint sit-down strike, where there's a recognition that workers should be allowed to organize and, and, and bargain uh, collectively, okay? So in the, in the 30s then, this is, you know, in, in many ways, the, the heyday of American radicalism. It enters this mainstream in a lot of ways by forcing Roosevelt to take account of its uh, demands. It gives people like Huey Long or Woody Guthrie culturally or, or, or Upton Sinclair a venue, a platform in which they can reach millions. I mean, seven million people join the share the wealth movement. The motto of that is every man a king, right? If there's something belonging to others, there's enough for all people to share, right? Can you imagine today a candidate with that kind of uh, campaign slogan? You know, I mean, look at the way the media treated people like Kucinich and, and, and Bernie Sanders. You would have thought they were Lenin and Trotsky, right? Uh, and neither one of them was saying, if there's something belonging to others, there's enough for all people to share. Woody Guthrie said, I mean, um, uh, Huey Long said that, and, and gets this incredible surge of, of support. So the 30s is, is really the heyday of that. Now, why doesn't it stick? One, because it's successful. The WPA, the Wagner Act, all of those things kind of mitigate. They, they do soften people. You know, the, the anger and the, and the energy isn't there, but it's also World War II. I mean, once World War II comes along, and this happened in World War I, it, it, World War I, when World War I breaks out in Europe, there's a strong socialist movement. And the socialists of Europe get together in 1913 and 1914, and they vote collectively. They say, if the war breaks out, we will remain loyal to our class. We will not fight a rich man's war, right? And what happens in August of 1914? What do all these workers and socialists in Europe do? They join the National Army, right? So this issue of of global class solidarity falls apart. Well, in the United States, pretty much the same thing happens. The specter of Hitler is so great that people are willing to set aside their problems. In addition to that, what's the Communist Party's view on World War II, or on, on what's happening in Europe? Huh? They want to fight it until August of 1939. The communists, more than anybody, hated Hitler. Why? Because Stalin, you know, Hitler has two, two bet noirs two particular things that he hates and considers evil. Jews, of course, and communists. And he essentially considered them the same thing. So when you talk about Hitler, you have to talk about the, the, the Jewish question, but also the Bolshevik question. And the Jewish repression didn't really bother the West because they're used to it. This is Europe. European leaders have always hated Jews, right? I mean, read, read The Merchant of Venice. Anybody read The Merchant of Venice? Uh, what's, what, what's that about? It's about Jews, right? Yeah, Shylock, right? So, it's, I mean, Europeans have always had that. So Hitler, until the pogroms begin early on, and just another European leader who hates Jews, you know, join the club. I mean, the Queen of England, her husband, Philip, I mean, he comes from this na nasty fascist anti-Jewish family, right? It's nothing new. I mean, when he starts the death camps, that's different, right? But they don't know that's happening. And as far as hating Bolsheviks, freak, the West is thrilled about that. Stalin's way worse than Hitler, 
right? So communists actually want the U.S. to get involved in the war against Hitler. They're pro-war until August of 1939. And what happens to that? Why, does, why did the communists flip? Germany and, and the Soviet Union, the Hitler-Stalin pact, agree not to go to war. So now the communists are saying, oh, stay out of the war, right? But essentially, the American working class, once the war begins, falls in line, all right? And you see very little dissent in the 1940s. There are a few groups which are really badly repressed. And that's why I'm not going to spend much time on this. It's not even on the outline, right? right? Because it's not really political, right? Who's the most repressed group in World War II? It's easy. Huh? Japanese. Yeah, I mean, they're put in concentration camps. Is that because politically they, they had any kind of program or agenda? No, they were put in camps because they were Japanese. Same thing with Italians, actually, not nearly as bad. Um, actually, the group which, for political reasons, the most repressed group for political reasons, I'll give anybody extra credit if you can come up with this one. The most repressed political group. For, uh, the most repressed, it wasn't a political group. The group most repressed for political reasons in World War II. More people went to jail from this group than any other. Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? They, they, wouldn't, they, they were conscientious objectors. They wouldn't fight. They refused to draft. Why, why, why the Jehovah's Witnesses over? I guess there were more of them. I don't know. They're more annoying or they're towards them? I mean, they're, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the Amish got, uh, you know, maybe uh, they were so, they were Luddites. The post office didn't travel with the draft notices or I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, more Jehovah's Witnesses went to jail for political reasons, for refusing induction into the, into the armed services of any other group. But by and large, you don't see that. But what you see uh, uh, after the war really erupts. And, and what you see after the war is a continuation of a lot of stuff that was occurring before the war that was put on ice. And the best example of that is, is Paul Robeson. And I want to talk a little bit about Robeson next week. But, but there's a, a four-part series that I don't know who did it. It's not bad. I watched it. I want you to watch it. Robeson is, is just an amazing figure. I mean, you can't do a class about American radicalism or about American protest or American culture without talking about Paul Robeson. He, uh, anybody know anything about Robeson? Anybody ever hear of him? Hmm? You watch that? I mean, uh, uh, um, this guy graduated valedictorian at Rutgers. He was an all-American football player. He spoke, I don't know how many languages. He had this amazing facility where he just picked up languages. And he sang, you know, I think Neruda said it was the voice of God or something like that, you know. He's the only one ever Yeah, yeah, he was in Showboat. He actually was in, what's that? Oh, incredible, yeah. I mean, just go to YouTube and, and just look him up, you know, play some songs. Um, Robeson also, though, uh, was not, um, well, oh, yeah, I have another thing down here. Um, I don't know if you've watched it yet. Uh, Jackie Robinson. Uh, the thing with, but uh, that, that's interesting too. But um, Robeson, though, uh, uh, could have, I mean, he was perhaps in the 1930s the best paid entertainer in America. He was pulling down $400,000, $500,000 a year, right? I mean, that's significant. You know, that's some serious lettuce back in, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, but he won't keep his mouth shut, he won't play ball. Um, he's an ungrateful Negro. The people who liked him called him an ungrateful Negro. The people who didn't like him uh, called him other things. Uh, Robeson, um, he was a lawyer, actually got a law degree from Columbia, too. Brilliant guy uh, who would always speak out against injustice. And Paul Robeson, in a sense, became the face of uh, American repression and American radicalism after World War II. Uh, what you see after World War II is the kind of counterweight. If the 30s is the heyday of American radicalism, uh, and this, you can make the same argument about the 60s or whatever. I don't really like era history, but in the 30s, there's clearly an uptick, right? Things are happening. If you want to consider the 30s that uptick or that heyday, then the 50s is the downside of that. That's when the repression hits rock bottom and maybe the worst in, in, in modern uh, American history, uh, state repression, all right? And we will do that next week on Monday and Tuesday. And then on Thursday, uh, I'll nail it down, but I'm pretty sure John is coming in. Uh, and just keep keep uh, checking your email and Facebook. When I something when I put something on Facebook, do you get an email announcing it? Yeah, on, on Facebook, you do, but do you also get an email that says? It depends. Oh, okay. Okay. You turn off the alerts. Yeah, I know I do. <laughs> so. <laughs>